Hey everyone, uh, welcome to another little check-in here at uh, Six and a Half Consulting. I'm on the road uh, today, so there's a hotel in the background. Uh, what I'd like to talk today about uh, is leadership. It's a topic that is relevant and it's one that I've thought about for lots and lots of years. The first time it really uh, dawned on me uh, the importance of leadership and my interest in it was at uh, the Kennedy School of Government where I did my master's degree uh, in public administration. And I took a course there by uh, a gentleman by the name of Ronald Heifetz. I, I was lucky enough to get this course uh, because most of the people there were much older than me, either uh, uh, ambassadors or, or statesmen, uh, high position, maybe mayors across the city, certainly high ranking military officials and, and a handful of graduate students. And luckily enough, I got into the class and uh, everyone there knew of Ronald Heifetz's reputation. Uh, he wrote a book called Leadership on the Line, and everyone was was just so anxious to hear what he was going to say and, and the lessons that he was going to teach us over the the semester. And I remember, even as a young 25-year-old, um, I'm 37 nearly now, uh, as a young 25-year-old, he came into the room, there were 200 of us in the room, 400 eyes on him, and he managed to make it feel like he was looking right at every single one of us as he came in. And, um, and as he slowly approached the podium, looking around at everyone, it was so quiet in there. Everyone uh, wanted to hear what he had to say. And his reputation certainly preceded him. And he put his briefcase down, took out some notes, looked up and said, so you want to learn about leadership? A very quiet voice. And he said, next, well then, I'll let you figure it out. And he left the room. And he left all 200 of us trying to figure out how the hell we were going to be leaders for the remaining 199 of us. And Ronald Heifetz didn't come back for a week, at least, is what I remember. We, we still showed up at class and we tried to figure out how the hell we were going to lead one another. His class was so powerful, and it stuck with me over the course of these past 10 years, that I wrote a blog the other day about what I think are the 10 pieces of, of being a leader. And I'll have to look down at my computer here and, and bring those up, but I'll share them with you, and, and I'd love to see via your comments what you think. Um, there's a woman who, who I also read, uh, Jermaine Porsche, who writes in a, in a book, Coach Anyone About Anything, that the definition of a leader is someone who has an idea about a future state and recruits people to make that future state happen. So those are the first two pieces, I think, of being a leader. It's someone that actually has a vision and then necessarily goes and recruits people to make that vision happen. The third piece of it, and there's 10, is that because leaders solicit, enroll, recruit people to help them execute their vision, they're self-aware. They know what their strengths are. They know what their weaknesses are. And yet they still require people to come and be part of, of their movement that they're creating because they know they can't do it by themselves. And so they recruit people with talents that are different than theirs, uh, both talents that... that uh, they have, but talents maybe that they don't have. So that's a real fundamental piece is the self-awareness component. The fourth piece is that leaders don't necessarily have to have authority. And that's where I think a lot of times we mistake or confound what a leader is. We think that a leader has a position of authority. At work, we call our bosses leaders typically, but they're not. They're just our managers. Managers are the people that execute upon a leader's vision. They're the taskmasters, right? Um, but they're not the people with the actual vision. So be very careful not to confuse uh, someone of authority as, a someone, as someone with leadership uh, abilities. Uh, they oftentimes actually don't have the authority, but they do have something that's equally as important, uh, more important to effectuating their cause. And what that is, is the power of, of relationships. Leaders fundamentally know that in order to get their vision uh, to become a reality, they have to have relationships with people. And by their very nature, they're vulnerable to emotions and to each other. They recognize that the power of connection 
in the human spirit is what ultimately uh, motivates things going forward. And so leaders are fundamentally great at relationships. Uh, that's their rod, as it were. It's not the authority that they have. It's their relational influence that they have. Um, the next piece is that leaders have a deep set of core values that they adhere to. And they're unwavering to, I think. And people see that and respond to it. And I think that's what we call authenticity. When someone is being authentic, they're living true to who they are, whatever those core values are. And that, that's a non-negotiable for them. Um, let me see here. That, that's real great. Um, leaders, the next part is that because they are trying to go and create something, a future vision, they also know that they can't just tell people to go and do that. People don't do anything that they don't want to do. People do things because fundamentally they believe in it too. So at the core of it, really what leaders are, are people that give voice to a cause. They're simply the courageous ones that they say, this is what should happen. And that enunciation resonates with other people. And then because of the relational powers, they're able to motivate others to, to, to go and actually execute on that. Um, that's really great too, is the piece about because leaders are just a voice to a cause, and what they're trying to accomplish is something bigger than themselves. Leaders don't need the credit. What they're ultimately after is creating a future state. And more so, they're interested in advancing all the people around them because they know that in doing so, that's going to get everyone to uh, this future shared vision. So leaders are not credit takers, not because they don't have egos, but because they recognize that the goal is much more important than the self. So that's pretty great. Um, there's a piece of courageousness that leaders, leaders have. We all may have desires of a future state, but whether or not we can actually give voice to that and then rally people around us to go and make that happen, that is, is quite courageous. So I think leaders, um, leaders are very comfortable in being uncomfortable. There's a notion that they, um, that they, they, they resonate, that who they are kind of resonates and not being certain about the outcomes, yet they do it anyway. And then the last piece is, and I specifically remember this from Ronald's class, is that leaders do two things at once. They're both on the balcony and the dance floor. They're both fully participating in their movement, in their cause, but they're also observant of it because they need to be able to look around and and mobilize certain pieces or change certain pieces over here. So they, they're fully engaged in what they're trying to change, but they're also fully observant of it. Uh, so those are the 10 pieces that I've come up with over the course of my life in determining what a leader is. I, I'd love to, to hear if those resonate with you.